Okay, well, we're going to talk about um, the uh, the gospel and the gospels. Now, the gospel being um, the message, and the gospels being the uh, the four books in the New Testament. Um, so, first off, gospel simply means good news. Um, it comes from the Greek word euangelion, um, which translates to, to either good news or, or you can say gospel if you want to. I mean, it's the same thing. Um, <clears throat> And, and people have asked, you know, what exactly are the Gospels? Um, they're not really biographies because they, they just completely um, skip over large sections of Jesus' life. Um, you know, and then obviously the question is raised, well, if they are history, theology, can they really be history? I mean, obviously the writers had an agenda. And, uh, well, to that... Um, yeah, I point you to this, back to this book, Can We Trust the Gospels by Mark Roberts? And uh, he, he, he answers that question about just because something is driven by agenda doesn't mean that it's not um, accurate or, or historical. So um, I'll, I'll let you read that book if you want any more introduction to that kind of an idea. Um, but as far as what the Gospels are, they can be called... Hellenistic biographies. And what we mean by that is biographies according to the time. See, at the time, a biography wasn't wasn't it, it wasn't expected of, of people who are writing biographies to uh, have a bunch of uh, a big book full of a bunch of pointless details. No, uh, a Hellenistic biography was. Sometimes short, just highlighting the main things that were uh, most important. Um, I mean, they definitely do have sermonic appeal in the fact that you, I mean, obviously they were to teach doctrine and whatnot, but very much so, um, you can tell that that they that they maintain the idea of Jesus. And so the question then becomes: Does it have to? Does it have to be word for word exactly what Jesus said in order? To, um, to be truthful? And the answer is no. Um, that was not what was expected back then. I mean, nobody... One of the things that made you a good um, uh, presenter, I guess you could say, in the oral tradition was that you were able to quote something and with that quote you were implying a whole deeper meaning that your audience would then be with you, um, that they would understand at the same time um, and, and your ability to, to reword not to where you weren't necessarily you weren't changing the content but just saying it a little bit differently maybe um, and obviously I, I know I'm not seeing this very clear so let me let me say this in a different way um, at the time that the Gospels were written it wasn't expected of the writers to say word for word it was expected of the writers to maintain the thought and the essence of what they were quoting um, without necessarily saying the word for word. So if you notice, John, for instance, um, you know, writes how Jesus talked a lot differently than, let's say, Mark records it. Um, you know, Matthew, for instance, kind of moves some stuff around where he composed the Sermon on the Mountain um, on the on the Mount. Uh, really wasn't necessarily all given at the same time, but Matthew reorders it to where it was all given at the same time, just to kind of make that um, that uh, structure that you're shooting for. Um, and we'll talk about this in a second, how Matthew was trying to create a certain feel there. Um, so it can be called a Hellenistic biography. It is a biography in the sense of what was expected at the time, not according to what was uh, what's expected of, of now, and once again, you quote they quoted more of the ideas or the essence of the speaker, not so much exactly verbatim. Okay, um, obviously with, with four gospels, hopefully, uh, I mean you can understand the the benefit of multiple witnesses. You have four different people all attesting to the same thing. So that that, that brings people to the to the to the question. So. Are there four different Jesuses portrayed? And the answer is no. It's it's very clear that it's the same person. They just have different emphasis, a different emphasis that they're, that they're that they're that they're trying to 
will emphasize that they have something differently that they're writing for and so they highlight certain things and kind of just drop off other things does that make it any less historical well no let's say for instance i said that president obama did um did uh Oh, what was that thing? The, the cash for clunkers. Remember that? And let's say that, to me, that's the most important aspect of his um, presidency, presidency. But then let's say somebody else is writing a biography on him, and they completely drop that off. Does that mean that they're lying? No, it doesn't mean that they're lying. It just means that they're highlighting something else. Now, of course, nowadays we have different expectations. Nowadays we want people to say exactly word for word what the person originally said. We want all the details. We want everything. But once again, you cannot expect ancient literature to conform to modern literature. Um, but for more on that, look at the textbooks that I gave you at, at the very first lecture. Um, so so they, they don't have four different Jesuses, it's just different emphasis. Um, the idea is this. Think of um, four different artists painting the same person, okay? But think of like, let's say Picasso does his, and he's got the jumble and everything, and and then let's say you've got just uh, Thomas Kincaid with with another one, and you see you know the ray of light or something coming in on the guy's face, and you know each of these four artists paint this person differently and highlight a different aspect. Is it still the same person? Yes, of course it's the same person. The artist just chose to highlight different things according to what he felt was was important. Um, so, uh, are there any contradictions? Well, for that, I once again go look at that book for more. But uh, basically, no. First off, <laughs> the Gospels each had a different audience that they were going for, and as a result, they kind of harped on different things. And we'll look at that in just a second. Also, just because something is moved chronologically does not mean that it is a contradiction. Okay. Um, Let's say, for instance, let, let, let's wind the back, wind the clock back. In the book of Ezra, we talked about how in chapter, I think it was like four or somewhere around there, um, that it goes down all these different things um, where the Jews were being persecuted in different ways. And I said how it mentions them in chronological order in the sense of, um, you know, the persecution, but I'm not seeing this very well. Okay, so in the Ezra lecture I gave online. When we got to Ezra, there was this chapter that was talking about persecution, but it kind of was out of place in the sense that it talked about all the persecution they faced from the start to finish of the project. So what he does is he's talking about chronologically what happened in, in Israel, and then he takes this brief discourse and goes on this long rant about the persecution, only to come full circle back to where he started and then continue in chronological order. So as though he's he's growing and the, and the and the rest of the persecution that he's talking about doesn't even happen until the book of Nehemiah. It still did fit because he was ordering all the all the persecution that they faced and put it all in one section. And then in the book of Nehemiah, they really don't get that much into the persecution aspect. Okay, so hopefully I I, I that made more sense. If it didn't make sense, go to my Old Testament Made Easy class and watch the one that, and the video about Ezra, and I hope that, that kind of explains a little more. Um, but then also, um, each of these four Gospels were unique. They, they were each, they weren't just trying to show the same thing over and over again. But if you notice, there are there are way more similarities than there are differences between them. Um, just because one was unique doesn't mean that the other one wasn't. Um, I know, for instance, one of the places where there's a discrepancy in the Gospels is where um, where the man goes through the roof and is lowered into Jesus. Well, in one account it says that there were tiles on the roof, and the other one it just says that there was, I don't know, a brick, uh, brick ceiling or something like that. So which was a tile or brick? And, and the thing is, well, okay, you see, once again, if you're contextualizing something for your audience, that doesn't mean that you're not giving giving um, giving an accurate portrayal of what happened. That just means that you're contextualizing it for your audience so that they can understand. Uh, let's say, for instance, um, let's say, for instance, you don't know what a gun is. Just roll with me here. You're in a country that that doesn't have any guns. All you have is is um, weapons to harvest. Okay. Uh, so you're out there working, and I'm telling you this story about somebody with a gun. 
And you're like, well, what's a gun? Well, it's kind of like one of those sitar things, and not, not sitars, but those um, those uh, things that you plow with. I can't remember what, but surely you see what I'm talking about. Just showing, kind of making it more relevant for the people um, without really changing something that, see what I mean? Just because people wrote from their point of view or made it to where other people can understand doesn't mean that it's any less true. It just means that it's easier to understand for the people who are hearing. So, um, so there are four different Gospels, and for good reason, um, as they are, are all unique. Um, so um, the reasons why they would want to, uh, or some of the reasons why they would want to write down the Gospels was, first off, um, the, uh, the apostles were dying. And, you know, as time went on, they were getting older. Even if they didn't uh, die by persecution, they would have died one way or another by... Uh, by time. I mean, life just isn't that long. So they wanted to preserve the, the, the story from the actual people who were there. Um, also, because Christianity was spreading, they needed, um, I guess you could say, help in getting the message out. Uh, this is actually what Jesus said, so they don't have to say, hey, well, what did Jesus say? Well, hold on, let's wait for the apostles to come so they can tell us, you know, now we have this, this book. Um, but then also for clarity, as Christianity kind of spread, you know, obviously as with anything, you kind of uh, – things happen and, and you kind of lose sight and, and, and myth gets mixed in with fact. And so as a result, you need something to bring clarity. And uh, the apostles gave that. You know, this is what, what – this is the story of the gospel that actually happened. So um, I hope that I explained everything there um, uh, well to you. Um, you know, with the Hellenistic biographies going backwards a little bit, um, the 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 um, um, the thing is, is, is you know, the Gospels, and in fact, the whole Bible was written according to the standards of the time. Um, I think it's increasingly irritating how people always find these little problems with the Bible because they're not understanding it in its setting. We were ta I was talking about this in the discipleship class last, last weekend, um, the way that in the book of Joshua it says that the sun stood still. Now, we know, that the, we know that the sun didn't really stand still, but from the person's point of view, it appeared as though the sun stood still. Does that mean that it's not accurate, that it's not, um, that it's not true? Well, no, of course it doesn't mean that. It just means that uh, people's personalities are preserved when they're writing it, God didn't just throw down a book. He used people to write the book. So, um, but when we're talking about the Jesuses, there's not four different views. There's four different um, emphases um, of the one person. I mean, if you look through the Gospels, the way more, way more um, um, unifies the Gospels than the Excuse me. Then divides it. Some people go to, oh, there's a there's a there's a, a contradiction here, here, and here. No, no, there's there's not a contradiction. Those two things, you know, those three things, can be unified together. You're just choosing not to because for whatever reason you have an unfair bias against something. Um, you you can't possibly expect. Well, I think I've said enough of of this. <clears throat> so that takes us to the Gospel of Mark. Um, you might say, well, hey, shouldn't we start with Matthew? I'll explain that in just a second. First off, it was written by uh, John Mark, who actually was not one of the twelve. Um, sometimes pe this surprises people. Only two of our four uh, Gospels were written by one of the twelve. So um, it was written, people people believe that it was, it was Peter's account just written by Mark. Like he compiled it or followed after Peter or whatever. Um, however you see it, they see that um, – or believe that, 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 that Mark was recording uh, based off of Peter. <clears throat> now, some people believe that Mark uh, throws himself in the story. Um, it, it, when you're reading, it says that there was a young man at the tomb or the, the guy that runs off into the night uh, naked. Uh, people say, okay, that was, that was John Mark. But once again, it could be you know, making a, an allusion to himself. <clears throat> <clears throat> but once again, not fact. So that's a possibility, but not, not necessarily. Um, 
it, it was written to more than likely Rome, um, sometime between the 40s and the 60s uh, um, AD. Now, when we're looking at this, it's important to note that the persecution of Nero was started there in the 60s, I'm sorry, not of Nero, by Nero, uh, by Emperor Nero, was started in the 60s. Um, and we'll talk about that in Lesson 4 about church history. Um, so if it was written during that time, uh, it would have been a very timely message in the fact that it showed Jesus overcoming through suffering. And that would have surely encouraged them. But even still, it would have been, been beneficial to the Roman church because um, I think it was in 49 AD the Christians um, were kicked out of Rome. I don't remember if the Jews and the Christians were just the Christians or just the Jews. I'll, I'll get back to that in church history, but um, in 49, um, either the Jews or the Christians were kicked out of, out of, out of Rome, and there was just uh, continuing persecution, and, and with the Jews constantly opposing the message of Christianity, um, it, it either way would have been um, a, a timely message. Um, just how timely. Um, so that takes us to an idea that which is called Mark and Priority, which basically means that the Gospel of Mark was written first and that Matthew and Luke both used it as a source. This is why it's called the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, because they all kind of, they, they all kind of have a, a main, uh, main theme going through them. Not theme, but they all have similar stories and similar you know, parables and stuff. Uh, they all kind of have a similar, similar structure to them, um, therefore synoptic. Um, but mo most uh, scholars do believe today in, in what's called the Mark and Priority, that Mark was written first and that uh, the, um, Matthew and Luke both used it as a, as a source. Um, one thing that's important about the Gospel of Mark is it highlights Jesus' failures. Um, for some people, this kind of catches them off guard, like, what? Yeah, it, it, I mean, obviously, um, Jesus was still a human, so he had human problems. Uh, one story in Mark, Jesus is trying to cast out this demon, and, I mean, it's it, the way it words, it makes it seem like he'd been trying for a little while, and he starts engaging in conversation with this demon. So I was kind of like, huh, well, that's something. Um, but then it also emphasizes his, his successes. Um, so we have kind of like the human and the divine both combined in the image of Mark. Um, also, another thing is uh, the messianic secret. Um, Jesus telling people, "Hey, don't tell, don't tell anyone who I am." And there's been a lot of theories as to as to why Jesus would want would not want people to know. But um, it seems best if we just narrow it down to maybe a real simple approach. The reason why he didn't want, didn't want the demons saying who he was is because testimony. I mean. Even if it's true testimony from a, from a bad source can kind of be bad. Um, you know, hey, let's say you know a demon said, hey, this guy's a really great guy. Well, coming from you, you know what I mean? Like, even if it was true, it's kind of detracts from from the idea of Jesus. <laughs> um, and then the reason why he would want people to be quiet about healings would would quite simply because of overcrowding. Um, during his ministry, it says about how all kinds of people were there. They were following him. They, kept, you know, they heard of his miracles, so they kept pressing close around him. It seems like everywhere that he went, people just kept wanting more and more from him. So it seems very, you know, reasonable for Jesus not to have wanted the people who were healed to say anything. Um, in fact, uh, one of the only, I believe, one of the only times in Mark where someone is allowed to uh, tell of what Jesus has done for them is the story of the man with with all the demons, but that was in the Greek cities. So when he tells them, yeah, go ahead and tell them or whatever, he's not going to the Jews. He's going out to the Greeks. In other words, preparing the way for when the disciples would go later. Um, and once again, Jesus hadn't been sent to the Greeks yet, so or I shouldn't say it like that, but I hope you get what I'm saying. Um, to where you know it wouldn't be a conflict of, of ministry. Um, so, anyways, um, and then also the, so then the last the last point there, uh, why Jesus would not want people to to say anything would be for his disciples. Um, they didn't understand that although he was the Messiah, he was not coming to set up an earthly kingdom. 
they wouldn't they didn't understand the the people don't don't pe the people that he was doing ministry for didn't understand i mean he feeds a couple thousand people and they instantly say hey let's make him king you know it, it, it the people just weren't getting the direction that jesus was leading so um, the Gospel of Mark also goes to great extent to show the failure of the disciples and the followers. In fact, the um, you'll see there which ending there, the second to last point. In all honesty, Mark probably ended with the um, with verse um, with verse eight, um, and they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. That's probably how the gospel origin, how the gospel of Mark originally ended, and people might say, "Oh, that's a dark ending." Well, that was kind of Mark's Mark's point there. The way that even though the women and Mark are portrayed in a very positive light, in the end, even they fell. Everyone was failing. Um, the, the, all the disciples and the followers were, were in a sense, failing Jesus. Um, you know, it, it but it shows Jesus overcoming, but it shows the people ultimately messing up. Um, so, I mean, obviously Mark was to great detail of this, and it's important to know, you know, that, that Mark wanted to emphasize that. So that's why I think that ending um, has the greatest um, idea behind it, because it really supports what the rest of the book is saying. Now, obviously there's the other endings there, and, and, and you're more than welcome to disagree with me. I'm fine with that. Um, <clears throat> And the thing about Mark, um, although it's not chronological, we already kind of talked about that, is that it is very detailed, okay? Um, in the sense that uh, he won't he, he he gives a lot more adjectives than other than other gospels do about stuff. You know, the green grass, for instance. Um, you know, it just kind of goes a little bit above and beyond in, in giving giving imagery, which is funny because it's the shortest of the gospels. So, uh, who knew, right? Um, Son of God and Christ are both uh, in, in, in somewhat important terms in the Gospel of Mark, uh, more so in the Gospel of Matthew, but but still very much a factor. Um, so um, that's all I want to really mention about the Gospel of Mark, which is, it takes us to the Gospel of Matthew. Now, um, this was written by one of the twelve, uh, Matthew or, or Levi, the, the tax collector. Um, it was written to Basically, they, they figure to the newer Jews' intention with the older Jews. Now, now people might say, well, well, see, originally the Christian church didn't see themselves as, as anything new. They just simply saw themselves as the fulfillment of what the Jews were looking, looking for. Um, so they, they, they saw themselves as Jews, not as, not as this new thing. And so when I say that, it was written to the, to the Christians who were now in tension with the, with the Jews, um, and you can just kind of see that throughout. Um, if you read it or, or pick up a survey, I'm sure you'll be able to see where I'm going with that. Um, but just the, fa the fact that, um, that you know, uniting the, the, the Jewish ideas with the Christian ideas. It was written probably sometime in the 60s, um, but after Mark. So I personally think that Mark was written around like 57 or so. Um, you know, uh, so then uh, Matthew would have been written in, you know, somewhere in the 60s there. Um, so anyways, uh, it has a very strong Jewish emphasis. Um, he, Matthew uses a lot of the Old Testament and he uses it in very, very unique ways. He really is a very talented writer and he's able to enlighten Old Testament texts that um, I, I fear would have been completely lost on, on Christians' um, um, had he not. Um, so you can see this in a number of ways. Uh, if you look at the genealogy, first off, the Gospel of Matthew starts with the genealogy. Um, if you look in the Gospel of Luke, the genealogy is after a few different things, and it goes all the way to Adam and Luke, and it, you know, showing that Jesus was fully human, that he came from Adam. Um, whereas Matthew's not really concerned about that aspect. He's, he goes, instead goes to Abraham, showing that he is part of the descendants of Abraham. He is part of the prom, uh, part of the uh, promised ones as the fulfillment of the Old Testament scriptures. Um, and then he obviously starts off the book with that, um, you know, showing showing that unique aspect there about Jesus um, to kind of relate him to 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 pull in the Jewish audiences. Um, so. Um, Matthew really has five main sermons 
um, throughout his book. And, and if you look, it seems as though – I read and I think it was Blomberg said this – that um, each of those five main sermons with surrounding material seem to be emphasizing a certain aspect of, of Christ. Um, I don't really have time to get into that, but if you read through those through those five main sermons and the surrounding material, I'm sure you'll you'll find the the overlapping or not overlapping, but the unifying uh, themes in them. Um, so, uh, as a result of it having its Jewish feel, um, Matthew's concerned with Jesus being shown as the teacher, uh, in a sense, a new Moses, the new lawgiver. Um, you know, Matthew has, you know, you've heard it said this, but I say this, you've heard it said this, but I say this. Just this constant idea of Jesus as the teacher, once again going with the idea of those five main sermons. So even though, like for instance, the the Sermon on the Mount probably wasn't given in, in its form that it's, in, that it's in in your Bible, that doesn't necessarily mean that, um, that, uh, that, that, those, that that's not true, it's just move the information around to form those sermons. Um, so, it also shows Jesus as descended from David. Uh, once again, another one of those important uh, Jewish themes. Um, I believe someone in, in, in Matthew says, Son of David, save me, or something like that. Um, I'm not positive, and it's kind of drawing a blank, but I want to say somewhere around like chapter 12 or something. Um, but anyways, um, we also see the kind of the idea of the Jew first, um, in the sense of you know before Jesus went to the cross, you know his ministry was the Jews, because he, he was to give that, that that fulfillment to them. The same as Paul later said, you know I've been called first the Jew, then to the or uh, you know I give I forget how he words it, but he basically says says first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. Um, but however, with all this all this Jewish stuff going on in, in the Gospel of Matthew, it's important to note that he still maintains a very negative tone for the Jewish leaders, which is surprising if he's talking about talking to Jewish people. Very surprising. Uh, there's been a lot of um, different hypotheses. Uh, Blomberg once again gives a great summary of that. Um, if you want more on that, uh, as to why um, such a negative tone for the Jewish leaders, uh, read that. But, uh, for instance, Matthew shows the Pharisees as, you know, really bad, when the truth is that the, the, the Pharisees weren't, I mean, weren't that terrible. I mean, they were a little legalistic, but, you know, uh, Matthew goes to the extreme as showing just very negative light on them. Um, so, once again, as we're reading, make sure that you don't overlook the good of the Pharisees because you read the Gospels and, and, and take that, Take it like that. You have to understand these were the evangelical pastors of the day. For Jesus to say these things about them, that was like, whoa, wake up call. Um, and, and you know, the other gospels do definitely show positive lights. I mean, the Gospel of John, for instance, shows about you know Nicodemus coming, you know, wanting, you know, the more more about uh, wanting to know more. I think it's the Gospel of Luke shows Pharisees inviting them into his house. You know. So make sure you don't get so caught up in the fact of, of Matthew portraying them in a negative light to teach a lesson that you miss the lesson and just assume that the Pharisees were terrible people. The Pharisees were not terrible people, and if you understand who the Pharisees really were, it helps you to understand what Matthew is trying to show. So, um, the Gospel of Luke, this was written by Luke, the physician that traveled around with Paul, He's not one of the twelve. Um, it was written to a man named Theophilus, uh, a, a Gentile, maybe Greek. Um, as a result, it has a very Greek emphasis. Not to say that it was written only to Theophilus, but um, that Theophilus probably um, paid for it. And I, I, I don't know how else to say it. Theophilus more, more than likely paid for Luke to write Luke and Acts. Um, so... Um, Probably Theophilus was probably a rich person. If you notice, Luke has a strong emphasis on the poor, and in fact, that emphasis is carried over into Acts. Um, it's talking about you know the Christians giving away everything for the poor, or to, you know so that they could share everything in common. Just this idea of of, of the rich uh, the the poor people. Um, it was probably written in, in the early 60s sometime. Um, probably once again, if Luke Acts were written together, and 
I kind of touched on it a little bit before. I'll touch on it again in the future. Um, then, you know, they were and, and Acts was written. You know, when when Paul finds himself in Rome in the early 60s, uh, well, then probably <laughs> probably Luke was written. You know, a year or so before that. So. Um, he he was not there, but he did utilize eyewitnesses, uh, narratives, uh, you know the the different the different stories and whatnot. Um, he did take use of that, and you can tell in some parts, for instance, that he very clearly talked to Jesus' mother. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Luke should be seen as one unit with Acts. Honestly, uh, let let scholars debate, you know, this and that. But if you read through the two, it's very obvious that they should be seen as one unit. Um, you see in Luke the ends of the earth to Jerusalem, and then you see in Acts from Jerusalem to the ends of the earth. Kind of the idea that it starts out with you know the the Roman historical setting. And in fact, I'll go to the next slide real quick. Chiasm in Luke Acts. Remember in the Old Testament class we were talking about chiasm. Well, that structure continues from Luke through Acts. It starts out with birth of Jesus in context of world history, Roman rule. Kind of just shows a sweeping broad, you know, um, stroke, and then Acts ends with Paul preaching in Rome. So then Jesus in Galilee, um, the church throughout the Gentile world. Jesus in Samaria and Judea, the church in Judea and Samaria. Jesus' uh, resurrection and ascension, the Acts starts with a resurrection and ascension. And then um, the church in Jerusalem, and, and I'm sorry, I missed that one, and Jesus in Jerusalem. So everything in Luke builds up towards Jerusalem, and everything in Acts kind of detracts from Jerusalem out. With the, th with the main focus of both Luke, of Luke and Acts seen together being the resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ. So, um, a, a main theme of, of, um, of Luke is, is Jesus' humanity. The fact that he had such compassion for the outcasts. Samaritans, Gentiles, tax collectors, sinners, women, the poor. In Luke, you really don't see any prejudice against any people group. Jesus goes to all of them. You know, Samaritans who were, I mean, let's be honest, Jews saw them as, as dogs. They were less than people. You know, the, the Gentiles, the, the oppressors, tax collectors, the, the countrymen who robbed from their own country. Uh, you know, the sinners, the people who are out there doing things that, oh, we don't hang out with those kinds of people. Uh, the women who, I mean, let's be honest, however you want to look at it, they really weren't seen as full people. Um, the poor who were the outcasts of society, but Jesus doesn't care. In, in the Gospel of Luke, you know, we, we, we see about Jesus' compassion for them, just the humanity of Jesus. Um, not to say that compassion is a human trait, but I mean more of more of Jesus' involvement with the earthly kind of aspect there. Um, but also, you know, Jesus as a human person, you know, for instance, I talked about this before, how, how Luke starts out with, and I think it's chapter 3, it talks about his genealogy, saying that he came from Adam, he was fully human. And then chapter 4 picks up, and he's tempted. Even though he was fully human, he still overcame the temptation. You know, once again, showing those themes without actually saying it. It's very, very well written. Um, obviously, as you can tell, Luke, acts as, Luke is my favorite of the Gospels. Um, so uh, we see Jesus as Savior, we see him as prophet, and we see him as, as, as human throughout the Gospel of Luke. Just a, a, a totally different uh, feel than Matthew was trying to portray. Um, it has more of a positive tone for the Jewish leaders. Um, I already kind of mentioned, mentioned how, like for instance, the Pharisees would invite him into their house. Just a totally different feel than Matthew was trying to get across. Um, and uh, another key theme throughout Luke is the idea of stewardship, stewardship in history. That everything that the Christians had, they were they were they were stewards of, and they had to take care of it and, and do well. I, I talked about this with with the with the themes of poverty throughout Luke and Acts, and how it was the Christians they were in the Christians' power to do something good. Um, so, but also Luke Luke is interested with history as well. Um, you know, it kind of gives it gives details about what's going on historically. They're very important um, and very interesting that he included them too. But even more so, we find Luke more interested in the acts of the Holy Spirit and how it applies to to the early church than we do um, any of the other gospels. Really, <coughs> I mean, um, 
And John talks about the Holy Spirit, but Luke shows the Holy Spirit. It includes a lot of stuff about G around Jesus's, you know, ch child life that I mean the other Gospels don't even talk about. Very interesting stuff. Um, and in fact, that that theme is picked up and carried on uh, throughout Acts as well. Um, in fact, many many people have noted about how the Acts of the Apostles should be more rightly called the Acts of the Holy Spirit. The, the Luke being about more Jesus as the center stage, and Acts being more of uh, the Holy Spirit being on center stage. So, um, I already talked about how how Luke and Acts form one big chiasm with Jesus' resurrection and ascension being the most important thing. Uh, Gospel of John then. <clears throat> was written by John, who was one of the twelve, but was not Jesus' brother. Um, it mentions him as the apostle that Jesus loved, or, um, but it really doesn't. Uh, it never says that, that, that they were related or anything. Um, and uh, so it was probably written to Asia Minor area. Um, John was associated with the Church of Ephesus, so for that reason a lot of people have assumed that it was written to somewhere in that area. Um, it was probably written somewhere between 81 and 96. Um, and, and really there were two different kind of themes that were kind of resounding in the Asia Minor area, and that was antagonistic Jews and Gnostic thought. Um, in fact, John and 1 John are going to c kind of not contradict, well, kind of contradict each other, it seems at times, you know, very strongly oppose one another's message, and even though it's written by the same person, <coughs> and we'll talk about that in, in, when we get to First John. Um, so we see um, more so than in any of the uh, other Gospels, in my opinion, the fact of love being a part of Christianity. Um, very much, very much of the idea of being a Christian and, and loving combined. That, that these are these are factors that, that don't just wash away. That's something something that that, that, that one produces the other. We also see John mentioning the Holy Spirit as kind of like the next step. When I leave, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. Kind of this idea of of you know the Christians. Um, for lack of a better word, right to the Holy Spirit. That, 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 that's a poor word to use, but the Christian's um, ability to receive the Holy Spirit um, and, and, and following after Christ. Um, as I mentioned, it has a strong contrast with 1 John. Jesus is shown as divine in uh, John, but human in 1 John. Uh, the law of grace is emphasized in the Gospel of John, but the law, doing the law, is affirmed in 1 John. Uh, eternal life is attained in the gospel, whereas in First John he's more talking about you know the coming salvation, the the coming uh, end. Um, there's kind of a relatively small emphasis on the significance of Jesus' death in John, whereas First John kind of you know plays on that quite a bit. Um, so John obviously had a very unique way of writing, but as you can tell, he wrote a long time after the other Gospels. But he really did have a, a very unique way of, of writing, um, very much so uh, you can tell – you can tell he just had his own – well, I mean, I don't really know how else to say it. He just had his, his own little – little idea of, of how to say things and as a result you know you have Jesus saying things in a, in a way that he doesn't say it in the other uh, Gospels so then that, that leads up to the question well so how do we know that, that that's that's good well for that if you want to know if Jesus what Jesus said was act in, in the book of John was actually true um, once again I point you to Craig Blomberg's historical reliability of the Gospel of G John um, Really, with, uh, with Blomberg, with Craig Blomberg, there's really very few that you can get into that you won't enjoy. Uh, even if you don't agree with him, uh, you'll at least enjoy it. But I hope you, I hope you, you got something from this. Um, just talking about the gospel and the gospels. Um, uh, next, le next lesson, we're going to talk about church history. We're going to talk about would you, would, so Jesus dies. What next? And then how did the church get to be a part? of the empire um, and therefore become what's known today as Roman Catholicism. Well, what happened? And uh, we'll talk about that next lesson. And then after that lesson, we will, we will resume our study of the rest of the New Testament, the epistles and Revelation. So uh, thank you for watching this.